aware of this evening's proceedings, and I'd like to start by asking you all to give an enormous round of applause, please, to our compere for the evening, Mr. Graham Davis, Barrister at Law. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, friends of the bride, members of the jury, fellow former citizens of the European Union. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the launch of a publication which is set to have more influence on the social and political landscape of the United Kingdom than Das Kapital, the Quran, and Fifty Shades of Grey combined. And I have to say, it's got all the makings not just of a successful book, but I think of a Hollywood blockbuster as well. <laughs> Because let's face it, let's face it, it's got everything. Love, hate, honour, betrayal, revenge, sex and smoked salmon. Okay, not much sex, but a hell of a lot of smoked salmon. And so, ladies and gentlemen, to conduct an interview of the author, please welcome onto the stage a man who is a respected journalist an accomplished political blogger, but more importantly than anything else, the publisher of this book, and a season ticket holder for that stadium over there, Mr. Ian Dale. <laughs> well now, ladies and gentlemen, the moment you've all been waiting for, the author of the book. For the last 30 years, he's been a very good friend, although sadly, not of mine. <laughs> Even before this book, he has been a legend in his own website. Will you please welcome Mr. Lance Foreman. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I have to say that obviously the Olympic authorities have treated Lance incredibly badly. I mean, ah. look at the, this is supposed to be a factory. <laughs> Tell us where this book started, because when you, when you came to us and said, look, I've got this book about smoked salmon in the Olympics, I have to say as a publisher, my heart slightly sank. So how, how did you persuade me to do the book? Um, you were the first publisher I came to see, actually. Um, I was expecting to be trawling around London and going after every single publisher and getting lots of rejections. Uh, and, and I came to see you, and uh, it was quite extraordinary. I, I, I was in, you know, welcome into your boardroom. You were sitting at the top of the table, um, focused on your laptop, which was open, not really paying any kind of attention. And your team was sort of sitting around the table. And I think, I think the introduction went something on like, something on these lines. Um, well, good to see you, Lance. Um, we just had Seth Flatter here telling us about um, the autobiography he wants to do, but we turned it down. And so tell us about your book. Um, and I think you gave me about 30 minutes, and um, well, fortunately the 30 minutes went on for about an hour, and I think you said that you sent me a contract that afternoon, and the laptop screen went down after about five minutes, so thank you very much. Now, let's go back to the beginning, because this book, for those of you, I presume most of you haven't read it yet, but this book reads like an absolute thriller. And anybody in this room who runs a business, and you, sometimes in business you, you conduct a sort of a risk reward ratio and sort of decide what the threats are to your business. Well, it's true to say that in this book you've had quite a few threats in your business. All of them could have actually meant that you've just gone out of business. Take us through the last 10 or 15 years with some of the sort of main threats that you've had to your business. Well, in reverse order, if, if I was talking to you 10 years ago, we wouldn't be standing, sitting in this very room. We'd be 100 metres over in that direction over there. It actually took us five years from the time we heard about the Olympics to move 100 metres. You say, what was it? About nine seconds, I think. But um, that, was, um, that was our the final battle of three battles, three main battles that we had. And that was a brand new factory. You know, a lot of people think that we've been there for a long, long time, we had this compulsory purchase battle, we moved here, and it was a great result. We had just spent two years building a fantastic new facility there, because the previous one, uh, that we'd been in for about 40 years, was flooded when this very river here, the River Lee, overflowed. We were about a, a metre underwater. 
And if that wasn't bad enough, that was a brand newly refurbished factory um, which had just been burnt down in a fire only two years before. So literally in the space of five years we had a fire and a flood and a compulsory purpose. And um, I, I now lecture at London Business School on crisis management. <laughs> and uh, I think my skills in, uh, in managing a crisis are probably much better than they are at salmon smoking, but uh, I've got a great team. We're only going to do this for, say, 10 or 15 minutes, but let's, let's cut to the chase and start talking about the Olympics and when you first found out that there was a threat to your business. Well, um, we read it in the papers. You know, we had just moved in, um, and within a year of having you know, spent two years building this new place, we moved into this new facility, and we read in the papers that the, uh, the London government, so Ken Livingstone and his team, were thinking of ha having the Olympics, hosting the Olympics, and it would be in this area. And um, we contacted an organisation which doesn't exist anymore, Quango, called the London Development Agency, which is one of Ken Livingstone's Quangos. Uh, because they had given us grant funding to build that facility. And it turned out that they were the people that were telling us we had to leave. So the left hand certainly wasn't talking to the right hand. And our, the, the, the key question that we had was, if London does win the bid, because this was 2003, so we asked them, if London does win the bid in 2005, how long will you give us to relocate? And they said that they would give us one year. Now it had taken us two years to build that facility. So we knew if London won the Olympic bid, we were dead. And our 100 year old business that we fought for, you know, with all these other crises, would be finished. So that was the threat that we were facing. Um, you are a politically switched on guy. You've worked within government, you worked for Peter Lilly, who's here tonight as a special advisor. Um, <laughs> he's over there. Um, he's waiting for a phone call tonight from Theresa May, I think. <laughs> Do you feel that you had a bit of an advantage, and if you hadn't had that knowledge, you really would have sunk without trace? Um, I think it was helpful. I'm not sure how good either Peter's or my political judgment is now, because I supported Michael Gove, and I think Peter supports Andrew Ledson. So <laughs> our political judgment has gone down the drain in the last few days. But, um, no, I, I, before I joined the family business, um, I started uh, my career um, after college in accountancy, it was a dream, lifetime dream to do accountancy. Um, so I started in accounting, and, um, and then I started, and, and as soon as I qualified, I wanted to leave. I was thoroughly bored with it, didn't really want to get involved. Um, but I, they, the firm uh, PW, now PWC, um, had set up this new privatisation department. And Eastern Europe had just, you know, just opened up, the Berlin Wall had come down, and they started getting me involved in privatisation work in Eastern Europe. And it was absolutely fascinating. One of the most fascinating parts that I described in the book is, uh, is, is how I was beating the, um, the global head of Price Waterhouse uh, with birch twigs in an Estonian sauna. So it's a really fascinating. Uh, <laughs> We've all done it. Uh, really, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's part of the complication. Um, and uh, so, um, so I, I had that sort of um, East European experience. And I started getting involved in Eastern Europe, and I met an architect very architect that designed this building, did an amazing job. This building, by the way, was designed in one month and built in 10 months. Wow. So if anything deserves an Olympic gold medal, that, that was wow. it. Um, but um, I started getting involved with him and um, we started doing some real estate work in, in Eastern Europe. But what it meant was that I had the perfect skill set, you know, finance, politics with Peter, and then this real estate to, to, to deal with this battle, this compulsory purchase battle. You couldn't be charged with three better skills. Completely fortuitous, but the, the, the government certainly weren't expecting it. Now, we, we can't go into all the details in the book here, but there was a lot of skullduggery. I would say you might not be able to say this, but I can. It seems to me there was a lot of corruption involved, um, not particularly necessarily among the politicians, but among some of the officials that you've had to deal with. Um, how frustrating was it? And when you, go, when you went home at night and talked to your wife about it, I mean, what would you say to her? Um, I mean, the corruption wasn't so much frustrating, it was the corruption and incompetence that was frustrating. You know, if you're dealing with corruption, you sort of might know how to deal with it. If you're dealing with incompetence, you know how to deal with it. If it's, if it's corruption and incompetence, it throws everybody. I mean, you just haven't got a clue where they're coming from, where they're going to. And the, 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 the challenge that the authorities had in dealing with us, because our strategy through this thing 
was that there was no point in fighting this compul compulsory purchase battle in the courts, because when you sort of research compulsory purchase law, as I have, you realise that even winning the courts was not a good result. So we fought this media battle. And um, if they treated us better than all 350 businesses, because it wasn't just us, you know, this battle was about wiping out all that land over there, 500 acres of land, was the greatest concentration of manufacturing land in London. 350 businesses employing something like about 12,000 people. So if they treated us better than the other people, it would set a precedent. They couldn't do it. So what they tried to do was this under the table deal with me to shut me up and keep me quiet. But it was so badly handled. And I had to draw their attention to the fact that it was badly handled. Um, it was just the whole thing was just a mess. It was very, very, very frustrating. How close were you to shutting down completely? Oh, really, no. I mean, it was, it, was, it was touch and go, and I'm not going to give away everything in the book, but there was a moment um, when the government contacted me. I was due to appear in court to cross-examine Sebastian Coe. I was, still, um, I, I was still fighting this official battle, and my claim was that this wasn't really about regeneration. You know, the official narrative of the Olympics was that we are going to take this land to regenerate East London. It's not about the sport, it's about the regeneration of East London. And the reason they said, there are two reasons they said that. The first reason was because legally they didn't have power to acquire the land for a sporting event. And if they said we, that we're going to uh, compulsory vote this land because we're going to have this major international event, sporting event here, they would have lost in the courts. They only had legal powers to acquire for regeneration purposes, so they had to claim it was about regeneration. Secondly, it was commercially in their interest to describe this as a derelict wasteland. You know, if you're going to buy somebody's house, you don't walk in and say, oh my god, what a magnificent palace you have. You, you sort of walk in and say, oh, the ceiling's cracking there. And the <laughs> you know, so they wanted to depress the value. So they built this sort of message that this was a deprived uh, wasteland. And it wasn't. It was a thriving hub of manufacturing. It wasn't pretty. But, um, you know, so we, we, we fought this battle and they had to sort of take me out of the equation. How aware were you that you were effectively fighting not just for yourself, your family, but you had all your staff that were relying on you to get through this and take them through it? And I think a lot of people who've never run a business do not understand that one decision that you, as the owner of the business who's running it, one decision that you make normally can affect hundreds of lives. Uh, well, you're right. And that was sort of one of the hidden benefits of the Olympics to me in an odd sort of way. A lot of owner-managed businesses, um, you know, you have the sort of owner that just thinks he or she can do everything better than anyone else. They're useless to delegate. But when the Olympics came along, I knew that there was no way I could fight this battle and run my business. So I said to my team, look, I'm gonna go and slay the dragon, or at least do my best. You've got to run the show. And, you know, I, I, you know, I cannot thank both of my teams, my home team, my away team, my you know, Lloyd, who's standing behind the bar there, he has done the most incredible job. <laughs> and, and my team, Rita is, Rita is somewhere over there, she features in the book. I mean, Rita was. I want to meet Rita. Rita was my heroine, absolutely incredible lady, kept everybody sane throughout. And, uh, you know, so, so they ran the business. At home, Renee over here, I mean, Renee basically took control. I just, you know, I just. But they organise everything, I just follow. I have no idea what's happening in my social life about, until about a minute before it's happening. So I'm just told where I'm going and, and that's it. So I didn't have to think about anything. I just had to focus on beating Ken Livingston, dealing with Sebastian Coe, dealing with the Olympics. And uh, without that support team, I could never have done it. You have kind of made up with Sebastian Coe and Ken Livingston. Which, I mean, having read the book, it's quite difficult to know how you could bring yourself to do that. <laughs> You're a better man than me. I am. Um, well, you've got to have a sense of humour, really. <laughs> that's, the, uh, that's the thing. Um, um, Ken Livingston was... He was very difficult. They were all difficult. Ken Livingston, Tony Blair, Tessa Jell. They didn't, you know, we, we kept writing to them and asking, will you come and meet us? You know, there's a real problem here. There's a real problem for the Olympics. Come and meet us, let's discuss it. And they kept brushing the thing under the carpet. They would not meet, they wouldn't acknowledge that there was a problem. 
And I, I can sort of see why, because if it was a problem for them, it might be a problem for London winning the Olympic bid. So they brushed that whole thing under the carpet. Tessa Jell went on air saying, oh, there's just a half a dozen businesses, you know, greedy old businesses trying to, you know, profit from the games. The chief, the chief secretary to the Treasury, um, so, sorry, the chief, the chief, uh, sorry, the chief whip, the chief whip actually made some comments on the radio saying that, you know, if um, you know if you want to make omelets, you're going to have to, you know, you're going to have to uh, break a few eggs. He didn't want to be the broken egg, and um, so it was, uh, it, it was, uh, it was difficult. But Ken came here, as my guest. We we hosted a um, we hosted a three year to go dinner, uh, three years to the Olympics. And Ken had made a remark um, quite early on in the bid that the Olympics won't cost Londoners more than a walnut whip a week. Yeah. And um, <laughs> so what we did, we had this special sort of Olympic menu, and we did this gastronomic walnut whip. It was about eight pounds fifty for the dessert. We could, we could, we could prove it right with our sort of dessert. So uh, from a smoked salmon. <laughs> but but um, we invited him, not thinking for one second that he would actually attend, and he'll do anything for a free meal. So Ken yeah, did attend. Um, Seb Co. Um, you know, I knew Seb before. That was the frustrating thing with Seb. I knew Seb before. In fact, when I was working with Peter, Seb had become a prospective MP, and um, you know, I was doing trade and industry briefs for all these sort of you know prospective MPs, and we'd met a number of times. I knew him. And again, so frustrating that when the Olympics came along, and I'd written to him and tried to reach out to him saying, look, there's a serious problem here, can you help? He just completely ignored it, rushed onto the carpet, pretended there was no issue at all. Very disappointing. Um, we'll finish in a second, but you clearly, you're a political animal, aren't you? You, you took a bit part in the Brexit campaign. Yay! <laughs> And this is something I talk about when I lecture at London Business School. Is is um, it's about planning and business planning. And um, there's there's a Yiddish expression that I mentioned at the start of my book, which is "man trapped and God laughed," which means man plans and God laughs. <laughs> and you know, I could have you know I could have come into this business 25 years ago and come up with this most amazing business plan about how we're going to develop this thing. But who would have written into a business plan that you're going to have a fire? and a flood, and a compulsory purchase. And that's life. You know, it, you just, you, unexpected things happen. And what I say to all these business students who go through business school, and they're told time and time again, you've got to have a plan, you know, you, you need to focus on, you know, this, uh, this journey. And when you, you know, when you're in business and you need to borrow money from the bank, everyone wants to see the business plan, and it's always the plan, the plan, the plan. And what I say to them is, look, you want to get from here to here. And that is your plan. If you focus on the plan, two things happen. The first thing is, you focus on this plan. Unexpected things happen, you don't know how to deal with them. Because you're too focused on your plan. You're not flexible enough to deal with the unexpected things that just happen in life. And the second thing is, there's tons of good stuff happening here, and tons of good stuff happening here. And if you're focused on this narrow journey, you miss all the good stuff too. You miss the opportunities. So planning, I think, is a bad idea. However, when you run a Vote Leave campaign, you do need to plan what's going to happen afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> and I haven't given any advice to Boris or to Michael. Who? <laughs> I was so hoping that the person that endorsed my book would be the Prime Minister, but what can you do? Um, George Osborne didn't have a plan, David Cameron didn't have a plan, none of them had plans. I mean, it was just absolutely mad, and here we all are. Do you have a political plan? Would you like to go into politics? Do I have a political plan? Um, that's a good question, that's my wife. Well, I'll tell you what, I have now had 25 years of experience dealing with oily fish, so I think it's probably the best <laughs> I'm not, look, I, about the day, or, I think the day or two after um, Vote Leave 
have Brexit happened, the vote leave happened. Brexit hasn't happened yet, but vote leave happened. Um, I was interviewed on CNN, and the, the whole Boris uh, Michael Gove thing happened, quite happened at that stage. And the, the presenter um, asked me, the news presenter asked me, who do I think should be leader of the party? And I made it very clear that I do not think it should be Theresa May, because I said that she was silent during the entire campaign, and silence is not leadership. So, am I expecting a call from Theresa May? No. <laughs> Just a final question. Yeah. Um, Foreman's has not only survived, it seems to have thrived. I mean, how's the business doing now? Uh, the business is doing just fine, thank you very much. And um, I have to thank so my parents uh, sitting in the corner somewhere over there. Because, uh, oh, over there. My father, my mother's over there. So um, obviously they were the third generation. I'm the fourth generation. They often say that family businesses um, self-destruct in the third generation. Uh, so we're not quite sure what happens before, you know, in the fourth, whether the, uh, the cycle starts again or the decline just carries on. Uh, but. Um, we just stick to doing things in our sort of very traditional way, just very calmly. We deal with problems as they happen. We take opportunities as they as they happen, and uh, yeah, we're really focused on just doing the right thing, quality. Um, you'll read about it on the book. I think it's said you've already. Thank you very much, and I hope you all won't miss it for weddings, funerals, bar mitzvahs, and children's parties. And ladies and gentlemen, please welcome, please remember, if you are a Hollywood producer, Foreman's Games, it's like the Hunger Games, but with much better catering. Good night. Well done, darling.